our feet. It is the light to our path, Lord God. Father, we thank you. This is the, the source, Lord God. It's the, 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 the logos, the written, written wisdom of the ancient of days, Lord God, that you've given us, Lord God, that you've preserved and entrusted us with, Lord God. It gives us that instruction, Lord God, in, in righteousness. So as we come tonight, Lord God, Father, we thank you for that word, Lord God. We thank you for that truth, Lord God, that's been revealed to us. And Father, tonight, we just ask that our hearts and minds, Lord God, would just really readily be prepared, Lord God, for what you desire to speak, Lord God, by your Holy Spirit in this place tonight, Lord God. We want to be uh, reservoirs, Lord God, and just readily available recipients, Lord God, so that we can be effective under every good work. Father, if there be anything that would hinder us, Lord God, any unrepentant or unconfessed sin, Lord God, we just lay those things down, Lord God. We don't want there to be anything, Lord God, that would in any way inhibit, Lord God, you from being able to speak to us in power and authority, Lord God. We lay those things down. We thank you for the blood of Jesus and the mercy, Lord God, demonstrated at the cross of Calvary, Lord God. Come and fill this place up with your power, Lord God. Give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding in this house. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Probably one of the, the, the books that I've read personally over the last 30 plus years that's really had an impact on me um, was a book called By Their Blood. And I've probably given that book away at least a half dozen times. So one, I may have given Josh one at one time. And I know I've, I've passed it around and I've ordered them and bought them off of Amazon and things of that nature and give them, uh, give them around. Uh, the book is probably a more modern version of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? It's an intense thing. And it really just demonstrates a lot of self-sacrifice to the point of, of, of really martyrdom and, and, and some things that are, that are, uh, that happen in people's lives. And, but what By Their Blood does, it really kind of brings it to a point that it's not martyrdom or laying your life down is not something that's relegated to things happening in the ancient past. A good pastor friend of mine from Nebraska had called me, uh, I guess yesterday morning, right after prayer, I'd answer the phone. And he and I just began to talk about, um, he asked me a question on, on basically end times. We were talking eschatology, but not, not in the sense that we were you know, arguing these points, just talking about things and people's perspectives. And, and, and really he and I were just sharing how some of those things change really as you get into God's word and God begins to reveal things to you. And you take really an honest assessment of things. Folks, how many of you know that there's a lot of things that we, we, we believe just because that's just what we've heard? You know, we've talked about some of those things as well, like out of Second Timothy, where he says that men will turn their ears away from the truth. They'll turn unto fables. And we've talked about those fables. You know, it's one of these things that people talk about that Jesus died. He went to hell and he took back the, the, the keys from the devil. You know, fables. That's Dante's Inferno. That's not Bible. And we, we talked about things, but there's certain things that we just kind of pick up along the line. And what's that terminology? Uh, uh, the Mandela effect. You hear it, so you believe it's just got to be true. And so me and him, we were just talking about different things and things that we've heard for years and just how we started changing. And one of the things we began to talk about is, you know, the perspective that we have from a westernized mindset is so much different than people in other places. And you, you read a book like Fox's Martyrs, which was more, more uh, you know, five to eight hundred years ago, uh, all, all the way back into the first century, or you're looking at a book like By Their Blood, and it, it's, it's so easy to kind of remove yourself from the equation and think it's not us. But folks, listen, there's people every single day. You know, the, the, the crowd that is, that's anxious to get raptured out of here because they want to avoid tribulation, there's people already going through those things. There's people in Indonesia and in, in, in Southeast Asia. There's people in, 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 in Russia. There's people in, in China and in, in the other various places in the Middle East and Africa that are already enduring those things that we in Westernized culture are hoping someday that we're going to escape because of a trumpet blast. And so he and I were talking about just things uh, relative to, to kind of the, the present situation, what we're, we're facing. And, you know, another contemporary source that kind of described these things, and some of you are familiar with, with the ministry of the late Richard Wormbrand. Do you remember Richard Wormbrand, Pastor Richard Wormbrand? He, uh, he was the, uh, under a communist, uh, uh, communist uh, what was it, Romania. And I think he was in captivity like 14 years. He and his wife, Sabrina, they suffered harshly. And here they were in prison and because of their work in the underground church in a communist nation. And, you know, he ended up getting free after many, many years, spent years in solitary confinement. Then they would release him. He just kept on preaching the gospel. I mean, he was kind of the guy that they just couldn't shut up. You know, at times people would come looking for him and they'd say, no, he's dead. And so they, he, people even thought he was dead for years. And all of a sudden, Richard Warmbrand would, would rise from the ashes like the phoenix. And he's still preaching the gospel. Eventually, I believe he moved into the, the Norway or the Netherlands, one of those one of those end countries over there. And eventually made his way of all, all places over to Bartlesville, Oklahoma. You know, 
right down the road from, from Mootown, Elk City, where uh, Thomas was from. But so we get people like that. But a recent story, and maybe, maybe you've heard of his, his ministry. He's, he, I think he passed in 2001. His wife, Sabrina, passed in 2000. But a, a, a ministry in a magazine that you can get called Voice of the Martyrs. But I was reading one of the articles. I'm going to just share with you briefly from it. And it was a guy by the name of uh, Mefri. And I was going to read this. It says that 21 Mefri en- en- enrolled in a Bible college in Indonesia with no intention of studying the Bible. So it's like one of these people that went to Bible college but didn't want to study the Bible. And, and it goes on. It says, although he had grown up in a Christian family, he had enrolled in school only to hide from the police who were uh, after him for selling drugs. Folks, I know people that come to church for that. There are people that come to the training center for that. I mean, I really don't want, want to do what you're doing, but I feel like it's a safe place and maybe it'll get the, the heat off of me. And he said, I was not in the Bible school to get born again. He said, when I was in the Bible school, he said, I was thinking of how I could sell drugs to the students and get money. You know, it's funny. We had a men's discipleship house back in Texas uh, back in the day. And uh, we, we had a bunch of guys. And, and this wasn't like the, the training center. These were guys that were fresh out of prison and off the streets. I mean, this, these, these were guys that rough customers. Uh, they became our friends and family. But uh, one day I get a call from, from one of them. Uh, and it was, don't hate the player. I hate the, <laughs> hate the game. His name was Clay. And he called me and said, Pastor Troy. He said, they stole the ministry van. I'm like, what? I thought somebody in the neighborhood had stolen it. He's like, no, one of the guys had stolen it to go do a drug deal. And so they were in the ministry house to do drug deals because our ministry house just happened to be in a very drug-infested area of town. But he said that he, he joined this, this Mefri. He, he joined the Bible college because he's thinking, hey, here's a, here's a fresh group of people. I'm safe, and I can sell them drugs and get money. But he said after a few months in the school and three years of selling cocaine and ecstasy, it says he was arrested and put in jail. Then one day, a pastor who visited the jail every Friday gave him a Bible, and as he began to read the scriptures, he said he recalled a few lectures that he just happened to have paid attention to while he was in Bible college at the time. And it said the, the lessons on God's love and that spoke to him in his time of need, and it said he felt, began to feel his heart soften towards the things of God. And he made the quote, he said, I read Romans 10 at the time. He said, listen, I was ready to confess that Jesus Christ was my Lord. And he said 20 days later, he said his dad, who had always struggled to, to, to make ends meet, came up with the money to pay his bail, and he ended up getting out of jail. And he says following his relief, he decided, I'm going to go back to Bible college now, but this time I want to go back and I want to really study God's word. In other words, listen, there was a wake-up call, and I realized that I don't need to be bootleg, and I need to actually get in there and get serious. And he said, I wanted to uh, become someone that God sends to preach the gospel. That's what he said. I want to be somebody that God sends to preach the gospel. And he said, when I became a student at the Bible college, my heart was, was, was not quiet because I wanted people to know about Jesus. And he said, I just found myself just always wanting to talk about the Lord. And he said, there was a fire in my heart to share the gospel of Jesus with other people. After two years in school, it said he arranged to begin to work, uh, to begin ministry work on the island of the Philippines, where he served with a house church for two years. It said he moved to Mindanao, a region in the southern Philippines, known known for being covered with radical Islam strongholds. And it was a very, very difficult place to share the gospel. And it says the government had literally ceded control over to the Islamics in that region, and the attacks on Christians was very common. And he said not many people wanted to go there, he said, because it was so challenging. He said, but it challenged me. You know, one of the mottos for our ministry is we want to take the good news into the bad places for Jesus. You know, a lot of people, uh, it, it's easy, folks. You know, suburbia in these places, so many people want to go. That's where the mega churches are. That's people building these fantastic ministries. Everybody's clean cut. Nobody comes with any obvious problems. They just can taper those things down. But he said, I want to go where the, it's challenging to go. And he said he quickly joined a house church of three families. And he says they all cared for one another. They, they, they supported one another. They lived with one another. And he said they did it so they could share the gospel with their neighbors. And he said, these were definitely not rich people. He said, they were farmers and they were fishermen. And he said, during the two years, he said, God stayed with me and provided everything. And he said, I saw God with me completely. And after two years with the families, he said, he moved to Indonesia, island of Borneo, to study at another Bible college. He says, there is when he really began to dig deeper into the scriptures. And he really focused specifically on the area of evangelism. And he said, he knew he had to know the Bible better in order to share the gospel in Islamic places. I love it that he didn't say, I need to go study the Quran better. I need to study Islam. He said, I need to be studying the Bible more so I can minister to the, the, those that are bound by, by uh, the Muslim faith. And folks, listen, we need to do that as well. We don't need to study talk, study the Book of Mormon to minister to Mormon. We need to study the Word of God. 
And that is, that's, that's the power. He's chosen the foolishness of preaching the gospel to save those that will believe. And he says that on Friday and Saturday nights, and mind you, he's in a heavily, heavily uh, occupied Islamic area. It says students from the Bible school would share the, the gospel with the local Muslims. And he said, I shared the gospel with so many. And he said, I began to baptize them right then. And he said, I remembered how God had turned my life as a criminal into a witness for the kingdom. And he said, he just found himself just weeping with gratitude every time that he got to baptize a new believer. And he's thinking, he said, I was thinking about what happened in my life because how beautiful are the feet who bring these things. Now, folks, I think about here he is. You think about it in, in, in context. I know people that, that come to the training center and they feel like they're poorly treated because we make them get out of bed on time. I mean, they really do. Uh, we, we get on to them for not cleaning the room. I mean, or, or, or we tell them that, listen, you actually got to do some ministry each week. And these folks were literally asked to put their lives on the line, and they considered it a great honor to serve the Lord Jesus. You know, we tell people to get out of bed. We tell people to be men. We tell people to serve Jesus and pray. And they say it's spiritual abuse, and, and we're a call. You know, these guys were willing to lay their life down for it. And it says he began to form friendships with students, at, even at an Islamic school during this time in Western Borneo. And it says that in that they invited him to come in and start this anti-drug group because they had heard his testimony to help people to get out of those traps or to avoid those traps that ensnared them. And it says as he shared that message that he also brought the testimony of Jesus into the equation and they began to listen to him. And it says after a few months, a student asked him for help. And it says that his friend wanted to learn more about this mercy of God that he had never heard about in the Islamic faith. And so he agreed to follow this young man. And, he, and the man said, I want you to follow me because I got some friends that want to, want to talk to you as well. And they led him out to a, to a local cemetery. But when they arrived, they didn't want to hear about the gospel. You can imagine what they wanted to do. And it says, so see, they started beating him. And he said, they punched him and he literally had to run for his life. And it says, as he was bleeding from the mouth, he took shelter at a nearby church building where some people helped him. They recovered him. They ended up escorting him back to his Bible school. And said so he remained at the school for, uh, for, and studied there for about six months and just completed his studies. Then it says, upon his graduation, it said he got a job selling water filters. I mean, so that's what he's doing. I'm selling water filters in Western Borneo. And he married a young woman he had met and, and they gave uh, birth to their first child in 2018. And it says, so what'd they do? It says they got married. He just said, listen, that was a previous time in my life. And man, that was real good. I said, no. So what they began to do, they began to do it together. Him and his wife, him and his new child in a heavily infested Muslim area. They began to put themselves in those places as well. And it says the couple began to share the gospel in all the villages. And it says that they began to reach out and began to see people get saved one after another. Now, notice that he didn't consider marriage and having a family as a reason to stop ministry. Amen. He saw it as a way to become more effective for the kingdom. Then it goes on to say in 2016 that he developed a friendship with a teacher at an elementary school for Muslim children. And he said after meeting with him two or three times a week for months, that teacher said, listen, I want to, uh, I want to learn about Jesus and I want to ask Jesus to come into my life as well. And so next time he visited him, he was, uh, the, the, the man's son who had came to the, the Lord confronted him and he told him, he said, listen, why did you give that Bible to my father? And he answered him and he told him and he said, so the man's son attacked him and, and, and got three other men to begin to beat him with clubs and uh, nearly knocked his eye out. He, he was able to get on his motorbike and, and speed away. And it says, but he got home and he was really discouraged. And here's the po point that really got me. It says his two year old daughter, somebody say two year old daughter, saw him struggling and she said, daddy, stay on fire for me. Stay on fire for me. She said, you've got to stay on fire for me. Folks, a two-year-old. And he said, the reason she said that, he said, because that was something that he had always said to her is, honey, you've got to stay on fire for Jesus. He said the threats increased. His family ended up going to another city to minister in Indonesia. And he said, people, this one right after another, began to get ministered to. But he always remembered that two-year-old when he struggled the most and said, Daddy, you've got to stay on fire for me. Now, folks, when I hear those testimonies from people in other parts of the world, folks, I get convicted. I really do. I think to myself, you know, what is it that we make excuses for? What is it that we back off for? You know, it makes me wonder how, how I or how we would, would, would are, are going to res uh, respond. And I'm not saying that we might respond, but how are we going to respond when those same persecutions find their way into our communities. 
Folks, they're coming. They're coming. And I tell you what, if we fold up on just the little trivial stuff at the moment, how are we going to respond when genuine persecution begins to come? Will we stand boldly for righteousness? Or are we going to cower behind some culture of compromise and some feeble excuses? You know, how would our church, I'm going to ask this question to you. I'm not talking about the, the, the church at large. I'm talking about how would our church, how would we hold up under the weight of the first century persecutions and hardships? Say, for instance, we were suddenly, you know, the seven to church churches of Asia Minor suddenly become the eight churches of Asia Minor. And the Harvest Center was, was linked right in there with those other ones mentioned in those first couple of chapters, three chapters of the book of the Revelation. You know, how would our church respond or what would we cry out? What, what would we say when people like Ananias and Sapphira died right on the spot for lying to the Holy Ghost about their giving? What would we think about that? What would we say? Well, I'm not going to that church. That pastor is just a little too extreme. You know, they took off the, took, up, took, off the, took up the offering and people lied about what they did. They walked out the door and the husband and wife killed over on the spot. That's a cult. That's spiritual abuse. That's way over the top. No, that's the Bible. What about what would we do in the first century if we turned somebody over to the devil for the destruction of their flesh so that their soul might be saved? Like Paul the Apostle did in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We said, listen, don't even have anything to do with it. We say, that's unfair. That's, that's not nice to unfriend somebody on Facebook or block them. That's not a nice thing. Listen, they, Paul went a step further. He said, I turn you over to the devil for destruction of your flesh. What about when people like Demas were called out for just letting life happen? Demas, having loved this present world, he didn't mean love worldliness. He says, he just had other things to do. He got really busy with life. And he says, he loved this world, so he's forsaken me. You know, or in John chapter 6, Jesus begins to speak to this large group of disciples, and he says to them that they would have to drink his blood and eat his flesh. And obviously he was speaking of identifying with his life, and not only his life, but to identify with his suffering, if they hope to have eternal life. And he asked them the question. He's like, listen, if you're going to serve Jesus, it's going to be hard. If you're going to serve me, it's going to be difficult. And he asked them the question. He said, does this offend you? Does this upset you that you're going to have to be obedient? Does this upset you that you're going to have to walk in faithfulness? Do you, does this upset you that you're going to have to live a sacrificial life? That's what Jesus asked him. He says, listen, because that's what it's going to take. He said, does this offend you? In John 6, 6, 6 of all places, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and they didn't walk with him anymore. Now, we know the context of this and we know who those people were. These people were were Jews that were coming to the faith. I guarantee those people didn't cease being religious. They just probably slipped into a less challenging environment. They probably slipped back, back into the, the, the temple and they did their feast and they you know, dropped their, their alms and they gave their offerings and they brought their, their nice little bullet. They, they did the religious things and everyone thought they were, were good. They wore their head coverings and they had their, 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 their little tapestries dangling from their their their. their the hem of their garment. They did all the stuff. They're like, this Jesus is just a little bit too extreme for us. Then I don't want to talk about the subject of overcoming adversity in an hour of opportunity. Overcoming adversity in an hour of opportunity. Folks, listen, for me, 30, going to be 34 years, uh, 33 years of, of, of full-time ministry next month, next week in January. It's 33 years of, of pastoral ministry. You know what I always find? My greatest opportunities are usually sandwiched between some of my greatest times of adversity. So anytime I find myself facing some type of new adversity, I'm thinking to myself, man, there is a tremendous opportunity that awaits me. And we see it. So if you have your Bible, turn to the third chapter of the book of the Revelation. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 14. Revelation 3.14? Revelation 3.14? And John the Revelator, writing there on the Isle of Patmos, begins, and he says, Unto the angel, this is the seventh church that he, he mentioned there. And he said, Unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, he said, Write these things. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He said, I know your works. He said that you're neither cold nor hot. And he said, I would that you were either cold or hot. 
So then because you are lukewarm and either cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And look what he said to open up verse 15. He said, listen, I know your works. Folks, that's the fact of the matter is. I mean, we can, we can say whatever we want to say. We can do whatever we want to do. And we can claim whatever we want to claim. But at the end of the day, he, he knows our works. He knows us whether we live here in, in New Orleans, whether we've driven over from Daytona Beach or came down from North Carolina or some other place. He, he knows us wherever we're at. We, we can't hide from him. He, he knows those everything in our heart, the thoughts and the intents of our heart. He knows everything about it. So he told them, I know your works. But more than that, that works word right there in the Greek is the word ergon, and it literally means, I know the assignment or task that I've given you. I know what I've called you to do, and I've said this many times, just because people change their mind does not mean that God has changed his mandate. Do you hear me? Just because we change our minds. And so you hear me say things all the time that I never want to be the guy that used to do something. What I mean by that is I never want to be a guy that just changes his mind and expects God to jump in and change his mandate for me. Folks, I know people all the time that bounce around so much and God told me this and God told me that. But it's like God's got this fickle thing that he's constantly changing his mind. And you know what? And it's amazing to me. Folks, listen, I, I come daily and I get on my face here and I'm praying early in the morning. You know why? You know why I'm doing that? Is it to look cool? No. I can look cool somewhere else. You know why I do that? Because I need to hear from God. I do. And that's the time of day where my phone's not ringing. Nobody's bugging me, anything else. At 530, when I slip over by my little blanket over there and I, and I cover myself up because it's a little bit cool in the, in, in the sanctuary that early in the morning. You know why I do that? I do that because I need to hear from the Lord. I don't need the distractions. I don't need all the other things that, 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 that as the day progresses, they begin to bombard my mind, all the other responsibilities and all these other duties. I need to hear from the Lord. And you know what? It's work hearing from the Lord. I, I pray and, I, and I, I read his word because I want to hear from the Lord. I worship so that I can hear from the Lord. I say all that because, man, it's amazing to me that there's people that don't put the time in prayer. They don't spend time in the word. They don't spend time in worship. They live a compromised life. But, man, they, they're the ones that just seem to hear from the Lord just like it's, it's, it's such an easy thing. Man, they're hearing the will of God and they, they, man, they know a clear directive and man, they're having prophetic dreams and God's speaking to them and they've got this clarity. And I'm like, how do you get that in compromise? Because that flies in the face of not only what I've experienced for 40 years of walking with Jesus, but the time spent in the word. Folks, listen, because I don't think we're that interested in really hearing from the Lord. What we want the Lord to do is hear from us and, and give us a big attaboy. And so when we pray, we don't want his will to be done. What we want his will to do is line up with our will. But he's saying, listen, I know your assignment. I've known what I've told you to do. And folks, I think about that some and I shudder. And we've talked about the testimony of just simple things. As simple as a, a couple young people, 23 years old, I think 24 years old at the time, that we decided, my, I, I come home, my wife said, hey, let's, let's go across town to, to, to visit a, a church in the hood. Now, listen, man, she heard something from the Lord. It's so simple. She, she wasn't the one that was going to be the preacher. She's just the person that Wednesday night that heard from the Lord that said, listen, we need to gather up this our little boy in, a, in, in his car seat, and we need to drive across town because God's got an assignment for us. And, and I said, yes. And I think to myself, even to this day, what if I have said, honey, listen, man, I've just worked too hard. Man, I've had a long day at work. And man, you know what? That's a long drive. Let's just, let's just stay over here. We can go to church. You know what? Man, we'll just stay home and we'll, we'll catch it on Sunday. Folks, I would have been, I think about that now, 30 something years later. I could have said, honey, listen, man, you know the baby. I want to spend some time with him. I want to spend some time with you. Let's just go get a bite to eat. You know what? Man, we're not legalistic. Let's not, let's not drive across town. But I think about, the impact that would have never made been made had we not made that drive across town. See, at the time, it seemed insignificant when you talk about things like that, just showing up at church on time, showing up at church and making yourself available. Folks, how many times have we removed ourselves out of position because we had a good excuse? Because we look like everyone else then. We're just a couple people trying to make it, trying to do our thing, trying to raise a family. And all of a sudden, my wife said, let's, 
let's be a little bit inconvenienced and do something. And it literally changed the course of our life because we just simply said yes. I'm glad she heard from the Lord that night because I wasn't hearing from the Lord. I was just hearing from somebody that heard from the Lord. And so, folks, sometimes we have to kind of adopt that mentality. God, what are you speaking to us? Because every step of the way, you're going to position us into a place that we can make a difference. Handing somebody a Bible that they drop in a gutter that these folks pick up on a curb while they're just, I mean, literally in a, in a life that was destructive and could have cost them their life. And all of a sudden, you know, they track us down on the Bourbon Street and say, hey, all of those people that somebody dropped the Bible, we just been reading the word. What if we'd have never made that decision back in 1991? We'd never be having this conversation in 20 and 23. See, folks, that's the significance of those simple acts of obedience that we we take. I know your works. I know your assignment. I know your actions is what that word ergon means. I know that which you've been appointed to carry out. Do you know what your appointment is? Do you know what those things are that God has called you to do? And folks, listen, sometimes it's not what you can see 25 or 30 years down the, down the road, but can you be faithful on just getting in the car and driving somewhere when God tells you to do that? That's what it was for us. It wasn't that the pastor was going to come up to me after the service, who I didn't even know, and say, would you preach for me? And it changed the course of our life. It wasn't that. And, and, and a year later, the, 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 the Derricks, six months after they got married, would walk into the church. Now, look at, look at the course of that. So sometimes it's just those simple things that we brush off and we think that they're insignificant. But folks, listen, if you can't be faithful over hearing God for those things, you're never going to be trusted in hearing God for the big things. Why would he tell you to be a world and shaker and a history maker if you're full of excuses for just simply being obedient to God in those small things? If you're faithful over the little things, he said, I'll make you the rulers over the big things. See, we think sometimes that God's assignment for us, it's insignificant until it's the big things. No, it's the little things that are joined together that qualify us for the big things. Ephesians 2.10 said, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Unto good works. That's what we're called to do. Which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. Folks, I want to be obedient to the assignments that I have. Uh, 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 Mel and I shared a, a testimony about last Wednesday when we left here, that here we were, we were going to go, and we ended up in it, 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 it Chili's. Places we don't like to go because the service was horrible and the food's always bad and, and we ended up there and man, it was a, it was a divine appointment. Now, you know what? We've been back to Chili's this week and it wasn't because we love Chili's. It's because there's a girl in there that now we know when she works and she needs somebody to come. And she's telling us, listen, I, man, I thought so much about calling y'all on Christmas. I need to spend some time with y'all. And so we're cultivating relationship. Now, we're not going to Chili's, even though we love those Southwest egg rolls and, and their chips and salsa. You know what? We can do without them. But there's a girl named Tanya there that was put in, thrown in a trash can as a baby that is not okay with us. It's not okay with us for her to be hopeless. Well, it seemed like such a trivial thing. Let's go get some dinner. But it was an assignment. Why? You've been created unto good works. Are you attentive enough? Are you obedient, sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit that you're realizing, man, every place that you put me, everything that I'm doing in life is an assignment or something that's going to impact eternity. And folks, I tell you those things all the time. Listen, I want to live with eternity in sight. I'm not just making decisions based on my comfort. I'm not just want to make a decision just, 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 just based upon those things that, that cater to my flesh in the now. God, I want to always position myself where I'm the most effective for your kingdom, regardless of where it sends me, regardless of what it costs me. Matthew 5 and 16, he tells us to let our light shine before men. Why? So that they can see what? So that they can see our good works, so they can see our assignment in action, so that they can glorify our Father who is in heaven. Folks, listen, when I am obedient to my assignment, when I am letting my light shine before men, when I am deliberate about putting myself in places and I'm aware of who I am in Christ Jesus, that that light came in the world and that light became the light of men. When I allow that testimony, just as my grandson was sharing tonight, listen, man, I want to allow that testimony to shine at work. And, and this guy, he's, he's coming under conviction and he don't know how to respond to it. So he's giving me half of his tip to drop in an offering. But, folks, that wasn't about the five bucks. 
It was about a guy that's saying, listen, something's happening. I, I feel obligated to do something. I don't know what it is. And so, man, here, here, drop this $5 bill in the thing. And, and, and next time, maybe he'll be coming and saying, listen, I want to drop to my knees rather than drop my five bucks in a bucket. But folks, that's because we let our light shine before men that they can see those good works. They can see our assignment in operation so they can glorify our father who is in heaven. He said, I know your works. And he said, my issue is you're not hot. Now, hot, folks, it's not that hot's good and cold's bad. We know that. We've talked about that many times over the years. A hot is to be medicinal. Maybe your assignment is to be hot. I kind of put it in that category. Maybe your assignment is to teach. Maybe it's to preach. Maybe it's to lead. Maybe it's to prophesy. Maybe it's to disciple people. And he said, I would that you were hot. Now, in a place like this, man, we got a church full of preachers. Amen. God prophesied that through me 30 years ago. He said, listen, man, I'm going to I'm going to raise up a church full of preachers. I stood in the pulpit at 713 North Johnson Street. I had no idea that, man, that he would use the venue of street preachers. Amen. To raise up preachers and teachers and people who are willing to, to herald and prophesy to God. I had no idea that it was at the time. This was even predated uh, our starting Raven Ministries in 1996. But listen, if your assignment is to be hot, if God has called you to teach, Teach the word. If he's called you to preach, preach the word. If God has put a prophetic word or he's called you to be a leader, if he's called you to disciple people, he said, I would that you do those things. That's the assignment. Let those things shine before men. Let that those that giftedness be so evident in you that you're looking for opportunities to pour in and to plug into people's lives. Now, folks, you've heard me talk about, you know, when Gideon first came to the Lord, man, I tell you what, he was like talking to a guy with a bag of marbles in his mouth. It's difficult. But man, he, he had a heart and a desire to do things for the kingdom. And so man, God began to do things in his life and God began to change. And so here he is. He's like, listen, where am I at? Yeah, I go out and preach on the streets and I do this. But man, God has given me assignment at my workplace right there at Federal City. And man, he's doing Bible studies. And he's like, listen, man, I want to be hot. And so man, I, I, I may not be have the most eloquent speech. I may not have these things, but what I do have, man, I'm come to you, not those things I'm coming in the name of the Lord. So that the cross of Christ would become ineffectual. And man, what ended up happening? He began to speak into a, a Marine Corps gentleman's life. And Christopher Davis, man, God began to touch him. And what did it do? It ignited a fire. Why? Because he was willing to be hot and to be contagious for it. And he saw his good works and he glorified his father who was in heaven. I would rather you be hot, medicinal. Or what about being cold? That's cold is not being turned off. That means to be refreshing. And I put in that category, maybe you've just been called to serve. Man, if God's given you the ability to serve, serve. Amen. Be that person that's first in line, throwing their hand up in the air, saying, God, I want to serve. Maybe it's to help, or maybe it's to encourage, maybe it's to, to intercede. Folks, listen, it's, 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 it's no lesser of a calling to be that person. But if, man, if God has called you to do that, do that without murmuring, complaining. Do it with excellence. Amen. Be that person that's first in line. So I'll, I'll tell you what, to be real honest with you. Man, I, God has obviously called me to preach and to teach. But you know what I love to do? I love to serve. Man, that's the thing that, man, that would be so easy for me to fall back into and say, hey, listen, y'all do all that other stuff. Man, just let me be the guy on the taco trailer. Just let me be the guy that, that picks up the trailer. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I could, I could hide back into my natural uh, state, state of being an introvert and do that. Now, I still get to, and I still love those assignments. I believe that the greatest in the kingdom are the servant all. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, for everyone. So every one of us, whether we're a leader, we, we are called to serve. But man, if God has especially equipped you for that, don't think that that's, that's a lesser gift. Because out of your servanthood, amen, it demonstrates the qualities and the characters of Jesus and provides a platform, amen, for you to share the heart, the message, and the love of God to other people. And so if you say to yourself, man, I'm not the gregarious one. I'm not the gifted teacher. It doesn't just flow off of my lips like somebody like a Hank back here, man. From the time he's 16 years old, it's like he opens his mouth up and just flows out of him. Man, maybe I'm not that. Maybe I'm a servant. Well, do it with diligence. Do it with excellence. So on the flip side of that, if God has gifted you in that, amen, don't, don't hide that stuff under a bushel basket. Cultivate it. Don't say, man, I can get up and I can spin a tail and I can say enough things I've memorized. Man, you ought to be the one because you're called. I'm just calling you out right now. I'm prophesying over you. You ought to be the one in the word more than anyone. When God first called me out, who wasn't naturally gifted, man, I would spread things out and I would grab a hold of the horns of the altar and say, God, you got to give me a word. 
God, you've got to speak through me, God. I want my words to ring like iron, like an anvil against somebody's heart. God, it's not okay with me to just to walk into a room and, and share with people as the pastor of a church and, and just think, okay, that was really pleasant. That was really nice. Man, God, I was begging you, man, because, man, there's people coming in that are bound. In our neighborhood, they were destitute. They, they, did, they didn't need some, some well-coiffed homiletic message put together. Man, they needed to hear something that came from the throne of God. So, folks, if God has gifted you like naturally like a hanker, my son-in-law Joshua, Man, you guys are, are, are got it in spades. Man, there ought to be a fire that's burning up inside of you. Or, man, you're a servant like Thomas. You know, you love to serve. Man, serve with diligence. Or my wife. Man, allow those things to be cultivated. Don't think that that's a lesser gift. But say, man, God, you've called me and you've, you've given me an assignment. And, God, I want to manifest those self in my life. But he said, when you don't do those things, when you're not medicinal, you're not refreshing, but when you're lukewarm or you stop, Moving. And you've heard my testimony. I preached right there at Laodicea. And looking up to the north, I saw the, 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 the hot water coming in. It looked like white caps. It was actually those hot springs. And I looked to the, the south of the mountains of Colossae, the, the, the white caps that were melting, the cold water coming in. But I stood right there and even preached where that putrid water gathered up and it just no longer moved. It was all those things that came together, represented the preaching, the teaching, the giftedness here, and the servanthood, and things here, and it just it pulled up, and it just become waste water, buried talents, wasted gifts, just rotten fruit. Some of the Lord spoke to me the other day. You know what? Somebody could at one time have the best fruit, but best fruit set on a shelf for too long, it'll rot. It'll rot. My wife went to the store a few weeks ago, and she bought some oranges. And she put them on the shelf and put them there. And not long after that, she went to the store and she bought some, some avocados that were so beautiful. Now, before we could look up, the oranges had green spots on them. And she had to throw that whole bag of avocados away. Well, it wasn't because the fruit was bad when she got it. It's just we let it sit there too long. Now, folks, it's the same thing in our life. That we think, you know what, I'll get around to using that fruit. Because I thought that. You know what? Hey, honey, why don't you eat the oranges? I'll, I'll, I'll get around to eating one of those. She'd say, hey, you need to go ahead and eat one of those avocados. Those things are ready. I'll, I'll get around to eating those. And I waited too long. You know what happened? They were thrown in the garbage. Now, folks, don't sit around because I tell you what, fruit that's sitting somewhere, not moving, is like the lukewarm church at Laodicea. It begins to rot. He said, but you say in verse 17, I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I don't have need of anything. He said, but don't you know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Folks, the rich literally means, uh, yeah, it, it can mean that you're affluent, but literally means it's like I'm secure. I'm set. I did my time. I'm good. Folks, you know why people love to go to third world countries and, and preach on the mission field? You know why people love that? They love to go and they like to go and preach to the, the, the little children, the little Black starving kids in Africa with the flies on the end. You know why people love doing that? Because you can show up with anything and they have a need. You can show up with a, with a bag of candy and you're the greatest person ever. You can't because there's a felt need. Man, I can go there. They're so loving. Yeah, because you've got something for them in the natural. Now, what if those people were, were, were well fed and they were well versed and they were well taken care of? I guarantee they wouldn't be as welcome. You know what they'd be? They'd be the westernized people. It's so easy to minister to people with a need. Why? Because now you've disobligated for them to hear you. That's why we like ministering to the people with needs. Well, fortunately, sometimes you minister to people with needs and you meet a natural need and you get to minister. Sometimes while you're ministering to people with a need, people without needs are touched by that and they're moved with compassion. And so Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He didn't mean that he was only preaching to the poor. It just mean through that venue, through that pinpoint accuracy that he had, he attracted other people that weren't poor because they saw his heart towards the poor. And he said, so, but some people say, listen, I'm good. I've done my time. I'm okay. I'm secure in my relationship with God. Folks, listen, I don't want to ever be that person that rests upon the laurels of yesterday. Because I tell you what, the Bible tells us very explicitly through the prophet. He said, listen, if a righteous man ceases to do his righteousness, 
that it says even his righteous deeds will no longer be remembered. I know so many people, ministers, my, my people, amen, that, that, that have turned it into a cottage industry of going around talking about what they used to do. It's like, what are you doing now? Well, let me tell you what I used to do. And their testimonies are not what they did last weekend. It's what they did 15 years ago. And they're still collecting offerings off of some old message. Folks, we need the people. We need to be people that put ourselves in a position every single day that we're cultivating a testimony, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's at a bourbon street or under a bridge or, or across the, the, the fence or at a homeschool meeting. Whatever it is, wherever God puts us, we need to be cultivating situations that we're building relationships and opportunities to preach the gospel wherever we're at. That's what people need to see in our life. Rather than saying, I'm good, I did that, there's no urgency. Folks, there ought to be something stirred up inside of us. Folks, listen, I've preached, it'll be, this coming February, it'll be 20, the 29th year that I preached on Bourbon Street. We came here. Dory was one of that crew that came with us. She and I and, 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 and Mel and, and uh, Pastor, Pastor uh, Alex wasn't with us. Holly was with us and some other folks that you don't know. But we were four of the, of the nine that went. You know what? I'm glad we're still doing it. You know why? Because there's not been an onslaught of people out there doing it since. You hear me? Somebody's got to stay in the way. And so really, come hell, come high water, maybe it's just me and Lou, but we're going to keep going. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep preaching that word. Because somebody's got to say there's 30,000 people out there, and I may not be out there for 30,000, but you know what? It's not that inconvenient for me to spend a couple of hours on a Friday or Saturday night when the other, uh, uh, when I just sit with my feet propped up in front of a television, in front of the boob tube, or on the internet. Folks, listen, I can get in my car and drive seven and a half minutes to the French Corner and pay $21 to park my van to walk down there and share the gospel. Folks, that's not above and beyond the call of duty. That's an assignment. Why? Because I just so happen to live in New Orleans where the, the, the world is at my feet and there ought to be something, an urgency inside of us, not for the church down the street, not for somebody across town. Why? Because we were birthed out of that. Do you hear me? We were birthed out of that. That's just not something that we do. We're called to restore a vision and to evangelize nations. That's not something I want to outgrow. That's not something that's going to become old hat. That's not going to be something that I'm not going to do that because those people aren't coming to my church and dropping money in the offering plate. Amen. Somebody's got to stand in the gap. He's got to find somebody that's going to stand in the middle of the fight and be a champion. Amen. You hear me? Where's our urgency in those areas? I'm increased with good or I've achieved success. I've moved over from the menial. I'm doing something else. I have no need of anything. Listen, I'm self-sufficient. I don't feel bad about it. Because I don't know what's worse. Feeling convicted or not feeling convicted. You know what I'm saying about that? See, I, I tremble not to be convicted by things. Man, have I got so self-sufficient? Have I got to the point that I don't need anything? That it's easy for me to say it's Austin's job? Dude, you're what, 22 now? You're 22, dude. I'm about to be 57. Dude, I've done my time. Let me tell you what I did, and you go do it. And not feel convicted? And I want there to be an urgency that rises up inside of me. It does when I look into the eyes of someone, I think, man, who's going to go? Who will they send? Lord God, here am I, send me. God, I'll make myself available. This really isn't that big of a sacrifice. God, I'll make myself available. I want to stand in the way of sinners. God, I want to be the one that's available to you because you've assigned me. The man from Macedonia has called us to a time such as this. But he said, and here's the kicker, he said, but you're wretched. Folks, what do you think it means to be wretched? Mentally, we'll swing the pendulum all the way to a point. We will. We'll think of wretchedness. We're going to think in complete abject wickedness is what we're usually associated with. But you know all it really means? Just to be calloused. Just to be indifferent. It's apathy. Is what it is. It's just to become hard hearted. Oh, Jesus, I never want to be hard hearted. I never want to be so apathetic, Lord God, that I don't think 
that it's important to let my light shine before men. I never want to be in that point. But God, I want to be that person that's just cultivating that in my heart and my life. Lord God, whatever it takes, however you have to move, Lord God, whatever, whatever conviction you have to bring, Lord God, I don't want to be apathetic. I don't want to be wretched. I want to be callous. He said, in reality, you're not only callous, he said, but you become, you're miserable. In other words, you're in the need, need of the mercy of God. How I many of you need the mercy of God like I do? You've heard my testimony 25 years ago or so now that I'm in prayer. And the Lord tells me, he said, are you willing to receive only as much mercy for me on that day as you give to other people? I knew the answer was no. He said, because blessed are the merciful. They're the ones that are going to take mercy. Why? Because whatever measure I measure out is the measure that comes back to me. Folks, that's where we're in control. That's where he gives us control. God, how much mercy do I want? Well, I'm going to demonstrate it. Folks, you know what mercy is? Mercy isn't a free pass. Mercy isn't five days after your payment's due that you don't have to pay a late charge. To a hungry person, you know what mercy looks like? It's like that taco that we hand out out there, Josh, on a Tuesday. That's what mercy looks like. Looks like a clean pair of socks to a guy that don't have any socks. It's the hug from a mom and dad to a girl that got thrown in a trash can as a baby, and she's 35 years old. She said, I never had anybody to hug me like that. That's what mercy looks like. Mercy looks like whatever's needed at the moment. Folks, what do you need at the moment? See, sometimes a good tail whooping is mercy. You know, it is. Sometimes the correcting voice of the Father is the mercy. That's what we need at the moment. It's whatever is going to bring us to that place of realizing what God desires. He said, but you're wretched, you're miserable, and you're poor. And that means to be spiritually destitute. You're destitute. You're just not spiritually minded. You're carnally minded. You might dress it up in a religious veneer, but you're spiritually destitute. And he said, you're also blind or you're physically, spiritually, mentally, or even morally darkened. Do things seem as bright today in your relationship with Jesus as they once did? Do they? Are you as ex- literally? Are you? Do you find yourself as excited about the things of God? Do you find yourself as animated in relationship to the things of God? Is there that same exuberance in your life? What happened? Has it begin to wax cold? Because that's what he said. He said because iniquity. Abounds, he said. The love of many will wax cold. There'll be this indifference. There'll be this lack of urgency that comes in. You ever wonder why you may get that at times? But he said, "I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear." He said, "Anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see." Folks, it's time to buy some gold. You hear me? I'm not talking about, obviously, I'm not talking about a precious metal, but you know what it is to buy gold? Folks, it's time to stay in the Word. It really is. That's gold to us. Heaven and earth will pass away, but gold, the Word, is not going to pass, pass away. That's what it is. Stay in the Word of God. Folks, this is the time, amen, that we need to get into that, not to think that, hey, I've done that before, I, I know I'm enough for that, but it's coming to that place, I'm going to stay in the Word. But it's also to get enthusiastic about prayer. Folks, I want to show up and I want to pray, whether it's early morning, whether it's on a Monday night, whether it's in your own prayer closet. God, I'm enthusiastic about prayer because I expect to hear from you. I always pray with a tablet of paper. You know why? Because he's always got something to say, and I don't want to forget it when he speaks it. it may just seem just a little few words jotted down on a page, but God, make us enthusiastic about seeking your Face. You know why some people aren't enthusiastic about prayer? Because they're afraid what he'll tell them. God, I don't want to pray because as soon as I pray, you're going to tell me something I don't want to hear. You're going to tell me to do something that I don't want to do. You're going to correct me in an area that I need to be corrected. But to buy gold is also to be bold in your worship. 
I want to be bold in my worship. That's why he tells us to come boldly into that throne room of grace. Folks, I'll tell you what. Compared to the way we're going to be in eternity, folks, many times we're just so passive in approaching the throne of grace and mercy. You hear me? I want to be enthusiastic. I want to get his attention. I want to be that person that's waving my hands, and I want to be the one da- dancing and shouting, amen, whatever it takes, amen. I want to transcend my own personality or the limitations of my own flesh. I say, God, I want to be enthusiastic. I want to be bold in my worship towards you. I don't want anybody to question my fidelity in that relationship. God, if people want to put, say put on a show, amen, I'm going to let my light shine before men. That's what you want to call it? You call it that. But I call it, I'm going to let my light shine before men that they can see my good works and glorify my Father who is in heaven. Amen? I'd rather them see me doing that, amen, than my arms folded in indifference and apathy and thinking, I wonder what he's thinking. Like I mentioned the other day, the preachers, amen, you finally graduate to a place when everybody else is worshiping, they're just sitting in the chair in the amen corner with their arms folded waiting for their turn. I'm like, shouldn't they be more enthusiastic knowing what they know and who they know? Be faithful also in your service. Folks, if you've committed something to God, be faithful in it. Amen? Be that broken record. Be that person that people can count on. God, if I've said something, I'm going to be faithful. Amen? Folks, being faithful will cost you something. Faithfulness isn't relegated to comfort. Amen? We're seldom faithful, amen, when we're uncomfortable. But you know what? Jesus demonstrated his faithfulness on the cross in the most uncomfortable time and the more in, most inconvenient and the most difficult times ever is when faithfulness, amen, had the greatest impact. That's why he tells us, deny ourselves, take up our cross, get in that place of faithfulness and follow after him. Be faithful in your service. Also be generous in your giving. Amen. And does that include money? Absolutely. It includes money. Man, I want to be a person. I, I remember Tommy Barnett from First Assembly in, in Phoenix preaching, talking about just, just being that, that uh, extravagant. He said, man, he said God taught him a lesson early in his ministry. He wanted to be an extravagant giver. Man, God, I look forward to that. You know what? God's blessed him abundantly. And we have to. We learned, that's one of the lessons we learned as, as, a, as a young married couple. Amen. Amen. We, we didn't talk ourselves out of tithing. We just oh, that's an Old Testament thing, and you, you, you only tithe off of such and such. Man, we were so anxious. Man, we want to give, and man, we were down to the penny, and we weren't going to rob God of anything. Amen? And it, it wasn't out of guilt or condemnation. It was that, God, you've blessed us. Amen? It might have just been that $4 an hour job that we had at the time, working 20 hours a week, and it may have been difficult, and the, the pastor might have looked at that envelope and thought, man, they ought to just kept that, but that's okay. No, we shouldn't. But we wanted to be extravagant in our giving. We wanted to be generous in that. But to be by gold is also to be extravagant in your love. Folks, we can't be dry-eyed believers. I mean, we've got to love people. We've got to be willing to lay our lives down for other people to the point that it costs you. Folks, love costs you something. I, I started trying to count up all the, 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 the weddings I did. I, I remember the first one I did it in, in February of, of 1991. Kelly Arnold and, and Becky Haddix. I mean, first wedding I ever did, and I've done tons of them since then. But one of the things you're always doing, you're always bringing them that 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians talking about love. These guys talked about that. Here's how you got to love one another. Here's the responsibility. These guys. got to About eight weeks from now. I said, what is it? Less than that, probably. I'm going to tell you that. You've got to do that. And you lay your life down even when it's inconvenient and even when it's difficult. I want to be extravagant in my love. And the final thing is I want to be diligent in my commitments. God, I want to commit my way into you. And I want to be diligent. In other words... I want to be active in my pursuit of fulfilling my commitments unto you. God, I want to do those things. He says, many as I love, verse 19, I rebuke and chasten. He said, be therefore zealous and repent. If I love you, he said, I rebuke you, I chasten you, be zealous therefore and repent. Don't you remember the first message I preached in 2023? That God was calling us really for a year of that, that judgment begins at the house of the Lord. And folks, judgment isn't just a place of, it's a place of condemnation and destruction. It's a, it's a time that we make things right. Folks, here we are finishing up, wrapping up that year, and I believe that God is bringing certain things in individual lives to the surface to say, hey, listen, we need to do things, because judgment will bring one of two things. It'll either bring brokenness or to bring bondage. 
Do you hear me? If judgment comes upon an unrepentant criminal, you know what it does? It puts him in bondage. Here's the price. You go to jail. You suffer. That's the bondage. But judgment upon the person who has a contrite heart, it brings really a, 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 a brokenness and a breakthrough in their life. Are you willing to allow God to bring a brokenness and a breakthrough into your life and humble you? And he said, behold. He said, behold, in verse 20, Thomas. You know, the same, the same Jesus that just two chapters over stood in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The one that it says that he had hair white like wool, eyes were like a flame of fire. Out of his mouth came like a sharp two-edged sword, and his feet were like burnished bronze. He was right there in the middle of everything that was happening. Now, because we've adopted all of these things in our lives, it says, now I stand at the door and I'm knocking. What pushed him out? We pushed him out. What kept him from being in the midst? It is somebody that has to now be a, a guest that invited in. He said, I stand at the door and knock. He said, if you hear my voice, hey, I'm here, I'm back. I don't like being outside. I stand at the door, knock, if you hear my voice and you open the door, I'll come in. I know you failed in these areas, I know you messed up, but listen, you don't have to keep doing it. I stand at the door and knock, and if you hear my voice and you open the door, I'll come in. You know what I'll do? I'll have dinner with you and you'll have dinner with me. We'll sit down and we'll have a fellowship meal. It says, why? Because to him that overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome. And I'll sit down with my father in his throne. It says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We stand to your feet tonight. Father, we want to be a people that overcomes adversity, even when that adversity, Lord God, is homegrown inside of us. Because we know, Lord God, we're living in an hour of tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And Father, we want to awake from our slumber, Lord God. We want to awake from our comfort. We want to awake from our apathy, Lord God, our indifference, our lukewarmness, our ceasing to move, our ceasing to have urgency. We want to move past our excuses, all of those things that we do, Lord God, and we somehow are able to convince ourselves of. But Father, you said, Lord God, that a shaking is happening, Lord God, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken, Lord God. And Father, that's what we invite. Father, we don't want there to be anything in our hearts and lives, Lord God, that would be contrary to you, Lord God, that would stand in opposition to your will and desire for our lives. And Lord God, we're asking, Lord God, tonight, by your Holy Spirit, that you would convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, Lord God. Father, you're not looking for an amen. You're looking for an obedience, Lord God. You're looking for faithfulness. And so, Father, that's what we desire. So we're asking, Lord God, even as we're closing out one year and, and pursuing in another, Lord God, we want to believe for more, Lord God, in 2024. We really do, Lord God. We know it comes with a price, Lord God. And we're asking you for the strength, Lord God, the determination. Lord God, to pay that price. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, Amen. 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 And amen. Amen. Once you agree, one that level one another. Amen.